Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to another exciting uh, course on uh, emotional well-being of the family part two by Dr. Mahira Ruby. Uh, welcome everyone and uh, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us again um, uh, today and I know that uh, you have been a very very loyal participant and you've been logging on you know all, almost from all, the, our, all our programs so we'd like to thank you for that and I hope you're finding these sessions useful and you're implementing it in your, in your own life as well as using it to transform your, uh, your community. And, um, and uh, as I continue to say is that uh, all of this is part of our whole drive and initiative to create an integrated transformative education and, uh, and parents pl play a significant role in that framework. Um, so I'm not going to go and talk um, or introduce Dr. Ruby in detail any further because I think we are all aware of Dr. Ruby. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually invite her in to, uh, to start uh, the presentation uh, for this session, inshallah. And, and then later on, we will take questions. So it will be about 40 minutes um, presentation, and then we'll have follow-up questions for about 20 minutes. And as I said, uh, as I always say, that after one hour, you're welcome to go. Uh, you don't need to, you don't need to uh, stay in the meeting. If you feel that you need to go, you're welcome to go. And, um, but we may continue for another five or 10 minutes or so, um, because uh, sometimes the conversation does uh, continue uh, beyond the hour. So we will be open for another 10, 15 minutes or so, inshallah, after the hour. Um, once again, I'd like to uh, give a special thanks to Dr. Ruby for um, for once again joining us to present uh, this uh, this webinar. And uh, just like last time, I'm sure it's going to be another exciting and insightful session, inshallah. So, uh, Dr. Ruby, welcome. Jazakallah khair. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here, as I say. Uh, alhamdulillah. Um, so I'll make a start because I always struggle with time. I have so much to say in such a short uh, amount of time, so I'll, I'll start inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem, bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, let me start again. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, as-salatu as-salamu ala rasulil kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hlul ukhtatam li sani iqa wa qawli. Rabbi zedni ilma, rabbi yassiru la ta'asiratam min bil khair. Assalamu alaikum once again, uh, Brother Faisal and the Nida Trust for uh, inviting me to your platform. Um, and it's always a pleasure to be here. So I did part one to emotional well-being of the family where we uh, focused on the relationship between uh, our generation, so the parents and our elders, so our parents and uh, the elders in our community, and how that impacts on family well-being, uh, particularly uh, the impact on children and uh, what they learn from those relationships. So today I actually wanted to come down. So we, we uh, as I said before in the, in the first part, that uh, what I present hopefully will bring research, community experience and faith perspective uh, in, in one, inshallah. So my, my uh, role in academia and my experience in academia, alhamdulillah, I have had the opportunity and the honor of conducting a lot of research in families. Uh, and my own PhD was looking at intergenerational relationships. So how really the focus on the child, how they navigate different relationships um, in, in the family as well as in, in society. Um, so Alhamdulillah, we, we're here on a, a platform where uh, all of us uh, are possibly Muslims and how does our faith shape our parenting, but also our family lives. Uh, it will be an aspect in this presentation as well, inshallah. And I've been involved in the community um, from a very, very young age. So being uh, a participant to now uh, trying to impact the community in a, in a way where trying to change the lens that we wear uh, from negative to positive psychology and a positive perspective on how we can view our lives as, as da'is, first of all, as, as individuals who are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also how do we radiate that experience and knowledge to, to those around us, particularly our families. Um, and so last week we actually looked at uh, the definition of emotion and uh, what we said that it's, it's actually a strong feeling which derives from, the, from our own circumstances 
mood or relationship with others. So emotions are actually driven by our interactions with other people and also our interactions with ourselves. So when we have interactions with other people, we, we then uh, create a narrative of how we interact with our own self. How do we view ourselves? How do we treat ourselves? And how do we then conduct ourselves with others? And when it comes to parenting, I think one of the driving forces for us uh, to, to create those emotions, where those emotions are created, is that we want to protect our children. And, uh, and that's driven again by our faith, where Allah SWT says in Surah Tahrim, that oh, you have believed, protect yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is people and stones, over which are appointed angels, harsh and severe. They do not disobey Allah in what he commands, uh, commands them, but do what they are commanded. So this is in Surah Tahrim where we are asked to protect our families from, from the fire of hell. So th this, is a, this creates a, uh, not just a drive, but a, a, a poignant emotion in ourselves where we are so protective of our children, we're so protective of our families. Um, and uh, how, how does that roll out as we go on our parenting journey? And that's really interesting because a lot of cases, a lot of uh, parenting work that I do on a one-to-one -one and a group basis is really, it comes from that, this feeling that we have been told to protect our families and we will do everything to protect our families. And this isn't just new to Muslim families. This isn't just new to us because we've been given a verse in the Quran to do so, but it's actually within uh, creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation of animals of which we are the highest because we've been given the free will. So we, we have given this instinct to protect uh, our loved ones and our uh, children from uh, danger, from things that will impact them in a negative way. So this is where the emotions are created. And with those emotions, we go on to parent. So this, this life and this journey actually starts from a, a, a very young age. So one of the questions I left you with, um, a few questions I left you with in part one, is that what, what's your story? So we looked at different uh, scenarios of where relationships can be broken, relationships can uh, be mended, um, relationships are difficult. Um, so we, we were saying that as parents today, really, what I want to focus on is what's my story? What's our story? What's my story as a mum? What's my story as a dad coming forward in the, into this parenting journey? So really, when we, when we come to parenting, it's not that you know, today my child is born and suddenly I, I become a parent. Actually, I've, I've gone on this journey, uh, as I mentioned, from, from a long ago. And I asked this question to parents, when do you think your parenting journey started? When do you think you started to think that this is a kind of a mom or a dad that I want to be? Um, so, you know, many people will say, when I got married, uh, when, I, when I went to secondary school, so many, so many different versions of this answer uh, can be given and, and narrated. But actually the story begins long before we even realize we're thinking of being, becoming parents. When we are toddlers, we start playing with dolls. When we are toddlers, we start observing how our parents are parenting. And that shapes the story of who, who we then become. Um, and who are we parenting for? So the verse earlier, it was saying that we, we uh, trying to protect our children from the fire of hell or families from the fire of hell. But actually in, in practice, who are we parenting for? Am I parenting so that other people can say that I'm a good parent, that Alhamdulillah I've managed to raise wonderful children, that I've managed to raise godly children, God conscious children? Or is it actually for my children that they can come to an age where they can say to me, Alhamdulillah, you know, we're so grateful that the way you've parented, we have managed to uh, know Allah, we have managed to know who we are, and, and now we can uh, contribute to the society around us. So that really, these two questions really depend on the third question, uh, which is how full is your emotional bucket? So when we think about our emotional bucket and um, uh, how full it is, you can say, yes, alhamdulillah, my bucket is full. But actually, what is it full of? What is the mixture in that bucket? Is it full of negative emotions? Is it full of positive emotions? Is it full of fearful emotions? Uh, is it full of motivational emotions? What kind of emotions are you, is your bucket full of? So I always ask, I always request parents and families and uh, individuals to think about their inner core as a vessel. Uh, and in that vessel, every day, every hour, every minute, we insert uh, feelings into that vessel. 
based on our experiences, based on our interactions with other people. And some of those feelings actually get dealt with. Some of those feelings are managed. Some of those feelings are uh, validated. Some of those feelings are uh, rejected. So we then become uh, an accumulation of all those feelings and how we uh, deal with those feelings. So this emotional bucket is um, so crucial to look after in terms of our relationship with Allah SWT and with other people around us. On this note, I wanted to just um, share a story with you. And based on this story, uh, I, I will carry on um, bringing the story into, as, uh, into the narrative as we go along in the session. So this story is about a, a parent who came to me um, a few years back and, uh, and you know, she, she came to me very distraught and she came to me initially presenting difficulties she's been facing with her 13 year old daughter. Um, and so she's been consistent, you know, her daughter has been consistently lying since year, year seven. So, you know, for about a year and, um, and also her, the, the daughter's school has reported to mum at that time that her daughter was self-harming. And there's a Muslim family. And, uh, and so mum really struggled to communicate with the daughter and found it difficult to deal with her behavior uh, as she also had two younger children um, to look after. So her husband, um, you know, worked really hard, mashallah. He worked really hard to maintain the family and often had to leave the home really early. And he, and he tended to return really late. And recently, since the daughter's behavior, this has become more regular for the dad. So he would come home uh, quite late. And mum really wouldn't have much time to offload. So whenever she did have the time to share things with dad, to get some advice from him, they would end up arguing. They would end up in an argument uh, as when, you know, she tried to explain some of the things that her, she's trying to deal with the daughter. Um, he would suggest that she needed to loosen up and she needed to stop nagging because he was also tired of her nagging. Um, and that's one of the reasons he shared with her that he has stopped coming home early. He would rather stay at work than to come home to her nagging. Now, when mom opened up to her siblings, um, she, uh, you know, they, they um, encouraged her not to seek counseling for, for her daughter uh, because this would draw attention to the family. But they did advise her, they said to her sincerely, look, you just need to change. You need to stop shouting at home. You need to stop yelling at home. Um, and actually she was the problem in the family and that because of her, the family was falling apart. Uh, in their view, it was her that wasn't really managing her role as a mom and wife. So when she first came to me, she was totally broken. This mom was really broken. Uh, she felt really alone uh, and she felt really, really confused. Uh, because she just didn't know where to start. Where, where should she start changing? Uh, what can she do to change all these relationships um, around her that had, in her view, had started to break down? Now, a few years later, I mean, I, I, I um, uh, did deal with, you know, sort of uh, help this mum at the time. A few years later, uh, this daughter, interestingly, I, I came across her uh, at university. And uh, mashallah, you know, she, she was a student at the university I was teaching at uh, a few years ago. And, um, and mashallah, you know, I was so impressed. I was so pleased. I was so uh, warmed by the, the daughter that I came to see at university. She had turned into a wonderful uh, young lady who was very confident, who, who was looking at a, a life very different to what I heard from her mom uh, a few years back. Now, the reason I share this story is because uh, this woman that is at the center of all this that I described um, is, is part of a system. She, this mother that came to me at the beginning, she's part of a system, she's not alone. But whichever angle she looked at in the system around her was pushing her to a corner where they were saying to her, you are the problem you need to stop shouting, you need to change your behavior, you need to be able to get up in the morning and look after your children. Why are you going down the route of depression? Why are you doing this? Do you not believe in Allah? Do you not believe that he's there to help you? So consistently she was receiving a message that she wasn't good enough uh, and she wasn't doing what she needed to do. So this system is really beautifully uh, described by Bronfenbrenner, who is a 
a thinker in, in how societies work uh, and his theory of human ecology and development is profound in, in the field of education. So he talks about these systems that exist in society. So you've got the micro, you've got the meso, you've got the exo, and the, you've got the macro. And in each system, you have people that interact with each other. And based on those interactions, you will define what sort of a person you are. So when I worked with this mum, we realized very quickly that her own upbringing had actually had a huge impact on the parents that she had become. So in her own upbringing, she was a part of a lot of, she overheard a lot of arguments. She heard um, her parents disagreeing with each other and really not knowing how they uh, re resolved those conflicts. She was a part of her mum becoming a very quiet individual where her dad did a lot of the shouting that made her mum feel that she wasn't very, she wasn't really good enough. Um, so really this ecology of human development involves a scientific study of the progressive mutual accommodation between an active growing human being and the changing properties of the immediate settings in which the developing person lives. As this process is affected by relations between these settings and by the larger context in which the settings are embedded. So her siblings, this mom's siblings saying that you shouldn't access counseling for the daughter or yourself is a part of how those relationships worked out, how the mum viewed that um, actually if I do reach out, how would people judge me and my family? How would people judge my daughter? How would people, would my husband even agree to us um, accessing counselling or uh, any support that I, uh, they needed? So this really is looking at the micro, uh, how our families function to the services around us. So the MISO, the next um, circle that you can see, looks at school, neighborhood, social agencies, the church, masjid, the extended family. So those relationships, again, dictate how the nuclear family function, how the smaller families function. And like that, I can go on, you know, into the EXO, where, again, siblings, classrooms, parent environment, grandparents, uh, foster carers, you know, all of those, again, shape um, our, our uh, environment as well. And then you have the courts uh, in the macro you have the courts the big big services that sometimes get involved in our families when they think that we are not uh, functioning in a correct way or in an appropriate manner so really if we don't take these systems into consideration uh, it will be really difficult to look after the well-being of a family because we are all a part a system of looking after the well-being of uh, a greater family which is a society and the community to the smaller families, which is our individual families. And, uh, and I just wanted to highlight to you that we don't work in isolation. When we talk about a village, it takes a village to raise a child, it actually means a society made up of institutions, uh, services, families, neighbors, uh, neighborhoods, and individual extended families to really uh, raise that child. And we most a lot of us don't have the privilege of having wonderful relationships between these different uh, systems. But what we can do is start working towards creating uh, from an inner and then from an outer um, sort of working relationship where hopefully, inshallah, in between we can meet uh, as a, a whole um, society, inshallah, looking after the child as a whole being rather than taking each part uh, aside. Um, so here I have a, a picture of a, a lovely young girl, uh, Sumaya, who was also part of my research project. And, um, and the story with her is that when we did some research and we looked at the relationship she has with uh, different adults in the family, so we looked at her relationship with uh, her teachers, her grandparents and her parents. And it was really interesting the view each individual had of this child. So the grandparent had this lovely view of this child that they have a lot of fun together. Uh, they they uh, do lot, you know, they pray together, they read Quran together, uh, they did lots of gardening together. This this young lady, mashallah, knew which part of the garden to water, which one she needed to leave alone for two weeks. Um, you know, she she learned all this from her grandmother. The view of the mother was that um, you know we we live in this extended family where my daughter and I really don't have much time to spend together. Uh, and also, um, I'm not quite sure what she learns being in this extended family, but you know, hey, we live in this extended family. We have different adults in the family. Not all are good role models for her, but some are lovely role models. Um, and hopefully, inshallah, one day she'll be okay. 
So the mum's really trying to be the middle generation, keeping relations between uh, all the other parties that are involved. When we spoke to the teacher, now, interestingly, the, the, her teacher had an interesting view of this girl. So she, they thought that she possibly had some special education needs. She was struggling between two languages. She was struggling between her home language and English. She wasn't quite sure, the teacher really wasn't quite sure uh, about the ability um, uh, this girl had in, to achieve her potential. But most importantly, the view she had of this extended family was that this wasn't a nurturing ground for this young lady. It wasn't doing her any favors. And what I found more interesting is that this teacher was from, from the same cultural background as this young girl. And, uh, and the view she had of this extended family was uh, of that when you live in extended families, the child gets lost amidst all of this. So where's the learning happening? Now, if you base uh, this idea in what I was saying in my part one, the importance of the child's relationship with grandparents and extended family, is that this girl has gone on to achieving wonderful things and one of the memories, when we interviewed her years later, one of the memories she has of, has of her upbringing is of her grandparents being the anchor in her life and her parents facilitating that relationship being a, a wonderful, nurturing uh, relationship rather than saying, no, you can't have this. Now you need to be a learner because grandparents can't teach you much. They didn't do that to her. They just let it all happen around her. What they did do was manage a routine for her that uh, enabled her to realize now it's school time, now it's madrasa time, now it's family time. And the family time was quite fluid. You know, they didn't restrict her uh, in, in, in so many ways. What they did have was bedtime um, and, and the morning routine quite fixed. So with, with, with this young lady, she went off to achieving wonderful things and her memory of her childhood was that. Now, Again, Vygotsky, if you look at Vygotsky and his theories of learning, what he says is for any child and their cultural development and faith development and any other development you look at, it happens in two ways. It happens twice and in two, two ways in, in a child's life. First, it appears on a social plane. So the social experiences a child gets is then internalized onto a psychological plane. First, it appears between people as inter-psychological category, then within the child as an intra-psychological category. So whatever happens in society, this child then embeds the story in their psychological domain as an identity of who they are. This is equally true with regard to vol uh, voluntary attention, logical memory, the formation of concepts, and the development of volition. And volition is the faculty or the power of using one's will. So, what I want you to think about now, those of us who are on this group together today, is actually those of us who are parents, grandparents now, what are we doing? What kind of an environment are we creating in our home that enables a child to fulfill the power of their will that Allah SWT has given them? The free will that Allah SWT has given them. So this narrative that we have as parents, I need a routine, I need to discipline my child, I need to manage my children, I need to uh, regulate this home. What do these all mean when it comes to your child having their own willpower, your child having their own um, you know, volition, as, as this quote is saying? So where does that child sit when every minute of the day they are being told what to do? Now, from our perspective as parents, that's good parenting. If, if I go into a home and see a well-organized house that is meticulous, that is really clean and all the toys are put away, first impression would be, wow, mashallah, these parents have it under control. But upon investigating and exploring, what we will find is that the child is being expected to follow a set of rules and guidelines where the question for me would be, have they had their say in that routine? Has this child had their uh, input into how they want to see their day being uh, run or panning out? So just have that um, thought in your mind as we go to the next slide, where we look at, you know, I took this picture uh, a long time ago and I love looking at nature to um, 
think about our parenting and, and I, I do I tend to do that quite a lot in, in plants in, in uh, animals how do they um, deal with family life how do they uh, deal with conflict and if you look at this picture it's picture perfect uh, photo of a family of two swans with their five siblings um, and uh, their children um, just just on an evening on a given day um, enjoying the evening together and um, when I watch this little family of um, I think these are geese or swans um, they parted so after a while the the ducklings remained with I assume to be the mother and the father swam off after a while and dipped you know dipping his head into the water enjoying a bit of uh, me time and then coming back and then I thought about this mom and I was reflecting on my own journey of motherhood and I was thinking, subhanAllah, you know, I sometimes feel I carry the burden of parenting on me a lot. So me as mom, the burden of me, of this family in terms of parenting tends to be imbalanced sometimes where I feel I'm carrying a lot of the load. And that gives me anxiety. That gives me uh, feelings that I often find difficult to deal with. I often find uh, difficult to rationalize. So when I'm feeling like that, the first person that I feel upset with would be my husband. That why isn't he doing his share? Why isn't he coming home earlier? Why isn't he coming home and taking at least one of the kids off of me so that I can uh, look after the other four or three or two or one in, in peace? Or actually, why doesn't he offer uh, to, to look after the children so I could have a bit of me time? just as he was able to just wander off and, and, and get a bit of fresh water and do what he needed to do and, and then come back refreshed and re-energized for that family to be a whole family again. So when these feelings come, it creates anxiety. And when we have anxiety, again, it's a bundle of emotions that we have. And this, this isn't something new. As Allah SWT already tells us in the Quran, that surely man was created anxious, fretful, and when evil visits him and grudging, uh, so we are fretful when evil visits us. We get really um, anxious, we get really frightened, we are fearful and, uh, and, and we, we uh, become secluded. We, we either suppress our feelings or we lash out in anger. Um, and then we become grudging when good things visit them because when good things come along after a period of sadness or trouble, we then say, well, what's the point? We forget. We don't know how to remember the good times. And so that if there's more episodes of conflict, it is really difficult to remember the good times. So often when I, by the time parents come to me, they are already on a journey of negativity. And they say, you know, they come to me and say, you know, I've tried everything. And subhanAllah, nothing is working. And then it takes me a period of time to work with parents to actually look at each individual relationship for what they are and then to look at how they can maintain that bond of kinship then to look at the child and really start to change their lens of how they look at that child that they are not the enemy our children are not our enemy our spouses often are not our enemy what is our enemy is all those feelings that I have put in my vessel that have started to become restless in my soul, in my being, that really doesn't let me sleep. And the reason it doesn't let me sleep is because I don't have a, a, a healthy outlet. Who do I talk to? So as I mentioned with the mom at the beginning, if you can imagine, who does she really talk to? Who has opened the door to them to say, come, you know, I, I get you. I, I, you know, I, I understand you. I'm happy to listen to you. What often happens is when we start listening to parents when they try to offload is that in our head immediately we have solutions that we want to give. You know, just, just be cool. Just be, how dare your husband behave like that? How dare your daughter uh, behaves like this? She's grown up entitled. This society creates selfish children. It's the school's fault. It's a set of uh, friends she has. So we start to give ideas to the parents, whereas First and foremost, the question we need to ask is, you know, how can we uh, reframe that conversation in a way that it is positive psychology and we look at 
solution focused um, conversation where we can think of is there anything that you can do any atom of chance you have that you can build that relationship is there anything that your daughter your son or your husband or your sister or your mother-in-law father-in-law whoever it is that does for you that you can start to be grateful for that you can start to uh, be um, appreciative of so when we look at that you know we have this beautiful hadith where we are reminded time and time again that every child is created in the state of fitter and that fitter is actually possibly uh, corrupted by parents by culture and by the society that they live in yet regardless how bad that society is that child is still yearning to connect to their fitra which is connected to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is connected to wanting to do the good and that is so important to remember when you think about well-being of the family whenever there's a crisis whenever there's a, a disconnect it is important to remind yourself that subhanallah you know when when uh, my child is in that situation i have to remember they still have a fitra in them if it's corrupted i need to find the right polish to polish that fitra with I need to find the right pills, I need to find the right company, I need to find the right advice to know how to reconnect with their fitra. I also have to recognize that I also have a fitra. I also have a fitra that is yearning to be good. That's why when we are depressed, when we are anxious, when we are uh, sad, it is because our fitra isn't connecting to the society that's living in. It is because it's hearing things that are not helping it to reconnect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it just needs to be recalibrated and we need to seek the right support and the right mindset to be able to recalibrate our thinking to be able to reconnect to our fitra. And as soon as you reconnect to your fitra that it yearns to be good, then you will only want to do good. So if you're yelling, if you're shouting, if you're criticizing, if you're uh, negative, then it's easy to say, well, that's not what I want. If I don't want that, what is it that I want? I want to speak nicely. I want to uh, smile. I want to be grateful. So those start to resurface in our vessel. And then the negativity goes to the bottom of our vessel, inshallah. So really, reminders like that are so important for us to keep having around us. This leads on to a, a, a wonderful um, uh, a notion that Stephen Covey introduces in his uh, Seven Habit, Habits of uh, Effective Families is the idea of proactiveness. And when you think about proactiveness and what I've just said uh, earlier, that in the, in the last slide is this positive thinking. So if you think about our lives and, and any given moment, even now, many of us have tried to find a space where we can listen to this session. I've tried to find a space where I can deliver the session. And now that's taking preparation. And there's a story in that as well. You know, I've, I've stuck a child on an iPad, which I don't like doing. I've asked so-and-so not to uh, call me now. I've put my phone on silent. I've made sure the cook is off. I've made sure I, I have a break from work if you're working on a Saturday. So there's so many things that you've done to get here. Now, if something comes to disrupt you now, the natural response would be, subhanAllah, you know, I've, you know if a child knocks on your door now and wants your time. The natural response to that will be, subhanAllah, I've worked all morning to prepare myself to get here. And now, you know, you have the audacity to come and disturb me. What is it that could be so urgent that you need my time? So the stimulus there is negativity because you've had a whole morning of effort. And then based on that, you will respond. Yeah. So here, the stimulus and the response in between that, you have a space. Sometimes it's three seconds, sometimes it's a second, sometimes it's a day, sometimes uh, it's a month. But we have that choice of how long we create that pause for, that space for. Now, what Stephen Covey says is that that pause is actually a freedom and power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom, right? So this pause button that you can use is the opportunity for you to either grow or to ungrow or to deteriorate in the relationship that you already have yeah or this pause button is something that enables us to insert a pause between what happens to us and our response to it and to choose our own response this is where our uh, free will comes into play and now how you respond is how you use your free will 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, encourages this pause by saying that this is the time you pray. There's a time you do istighfar. There's a time you, you know, you, you make dua. There's a time where you say to your child, I need a bit of time. There's a time you say to your spouse, maybe this isn't the right time to talk about it. Let us be in a better space and we can deal with this at a later time. So this pause is so important. Now, if you have a teenager there, this pause is to be able to say to your teenager, you know, honey, honey I love you so much. And I know that if we start discussing this now, it will break us apart. What I would like to do is find a space to be able to do this properly. It's because I love you, I want to do this right? That could mean, why don't you go and have a cup of tea, or I go and have a cup of tea, or why don't we just all each go to our room, and we regroup in uh, 15 minutes time. At the beginning, it might sound really undoable, you know, um, because my child will look at me and laugh, and they'll think I've gone crazy, what's happened between yesterday and today, what's mum doing, what's dad doing, uh, because normally they would yell, or normally they would call me a name, or normally they would do A, B, C, and that's fine. The courage we need to have is to be able to go on this journey and say, I'm okay to do it because I'm the parent. I need to take responsibility. I choose not to argue with my spouse uh, so that my children hear and, uh, and they go on to have anxiety. So it's so important that um, we, we take this time to pause. Now, if, you, if I go back to the, the mum I was telling you about at the beginning, one of the things we learned to do through our sessions was to help her pause was to, for her to think, what is it that I want out of life? I requested her to pause her life in terms of parenting, in terms of being a wife, in terms of being a daughter, a sister. And I asked her to pause and think about her relationship with Allah. Where was her relationship with Allah? What, is, what were her dreams before she even uh, be, you know, was married? What, was, what were the things that she wanted to achieve? And slowly we, we use this pause to focus on mum a little bit, to focus on how she felt about herself, how she uh, wanted to uh, shape her uh, free time, which she at the time didn't think she had. So we, we then pack, found pockets of uh, small spaces where she did have uh, time in the day where she could focus on a bit of reading, a bit of painting, a bit of uh, a calling a friend she hadn't called in many years. So this pause actually allowed mum to be in a space where she started to value herself. Not value herself in this world where what, what happened to her children then? You know, she valued herself as a worshiper. She was doing her tahajjud in a different way. She was doing her nafal prayer in a different way. She was, once she started to do that, it started to impact on the responses that she was giving to, to her children, to her spouse, uh, to those around her. So this, this idea that um, you can be proactive in using your free will is so important because then that shapes the lens that you're wearing because the language starts to change the language starts to shift that you um, you use so here we have you know the circle of influence or the circle of concern is to listen to your own language what kind of language are you using at home and often I ask parents again to observe themselves in a week give yourself a week and really have a little notebook and write down, even before you put in any intervention, observe yourself. Look at the language you're using with your children. Look at the language you're using with your spouse. At the end of the day, the other reminder that we have is we are only accountable for our own actions. I can only be in control of my own self and my own actions and my own behavior and my own thought process and my own views, worldviews and how I view others around me. So Allah SWT will hold me account to that. So then when you start to take that viewpoint your circle of concern shifts to the circle of influence because in your circle of concern what we tend to do is blame others accuse accuse other people for our behavior react to other people's behavior and say i can't do this anymore i've had enough i've been a slave in this house for long enough i've just served and served and served and i've got nothing back so this this idea that consumes us is that i am the victim and this circle of concern can easily, over time and with support, can change your circle of influence. And that changes to accepting responsibility, um, being proactive in how you see things and do things. And that language shifts then to, Alhamdulillah, you know, I can do this. Yes, I have seen my daughter do this. I have seen my son pray on his own. And I need to pick up on those good behavior. I have seen my husband actually uh, hovering around me, wanting my time. And 
what I realized was I just shouted at him or I ignored him or I just moved away and I didn't say anything. So, you know, you start to notice things that you can have a influence over and somebody's bad day then becomes an opportunity to be kind and offense then becomes an opportunity to apologize and to seek forgiveness. So we, it eases our sense of ego where we stand. The child needs to come and apologize to me. No, actually, you know, there's more power in me going and apologizing to my child and having a, a good conversation with them that teaches them this is how you deal with conflict. When somebody tries to gossip uh, with you, even amongst the children about another child, for instance, we have the story of Yusuf, -Salam, how his brothers try to diminish uh, the love of, of the father for, the, for Yusuf, -Salam. again, this type of opportunities becomes an opportunity to be loyal to those who are not present. So if your one child is, you know, children use the word snitching when we say that, uh, why are you snitching on your sibling? When they do that, I don't know what the current word is used by young people, actually. This is one that I grew up with. So when they, when, when they come to do that, can you use that oppor opportunity to teach this child that actually we need to be uh, kind, we need to uh, think of the good things that person has done for you. That doesn't mean that you negate the feeling this child has. You acknowledge this child's feeling and say, I get you, I hear you. What is it that you want me to do to make this better? Um, rather than saying, you're being horrible to your sibling, you're being nasty, or yeah, I know, you know, I get it because I, he was, or she was horrible to me as well. And they are the problem in this family. So you identify a child being the problem child in the family. So the language that you, we use with our children, this is such a powerful cartoon that you can see. And there's another one of a young boy where these words are around his throat. So these, these pictures are so powerful in what, what we say is being internalized by the child as their identity, as who they start to think they are, right? And so, you know, we need to be so careful when we are angry, it's about where we are, not how the child should be receiving our anger. So as adults, we need to be able to manage our feelings better in order to give uh, a user language that will be uh, suitable for the child to understand how they can learn from this incident rather than being belittled um, and um, uh, riddled with, with pain uh, from that interaction. So if we think about um, you know, emotional well-being in a family, um, recently you know, we have been through a lockdown for many families, actually, this lockdown has been a blessing because they found that we must have had some ingredients that has made us into a good family. So we were able to build on it. For other families, it's been an absolute nightmare because they've had things that hasn't worked as a family and they've actually caused distance between each other. Now they're under lockdown, they're in each other's faces. It's torn the family apart. Now, really well-being is uh is really fundamentally to do with how you deal with conflict how you how you manage those difficult conversations at home so when you have emotions when when there are emotions being expressed in the home it's a good thing because it's out there at least you know what emotions you're dealing with first of all it's so important to acknowledge we have these emotions it's so important to acknowledge that uh, we will we celebrate these emotions. It's so important to acknowledge that in this house, emotions are a good thing. However, there are certain emotions we will talk about and we will discuss how to manage better, such as anger, such as sadness, such as um, jealousy, envy. So there are emotions that uh, we need to learn how to better manage. So when you are able to do that, it can be a move towards relieving stress. So when one is able to express emotion, so if my, uh, and I remember when our boys were growing up, one of the things that we decided to do was buy a punch bag. Um, and that's in our garden. Even now the children are a lot older. Now I don't know whether it's because they are stressed or they have particular things they need to deal with, or it's just something they enjoy. Sometimes in the, you know, late at night, I hear one of the boys outside punching the bag. And part of me feels relieved that they're able to do that. Because when you're able to do that, it releases some of those negative hormones that causes uh, anxiety and stress. So you finding a family way of relieving stress is, is key to actually um, reducing the anxiety in the family and increasing the well-being of your family. And also when you're able to deal with those emotions, it can also give you purpose. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, at the beginning, 
our purpose actually is to keep our children from the fire of hell. And if you want to change that lens, because when you think of fire of hell, you start to parent from fear. When you then say, well, actually, if I don't want them to be in hell, where do, I, where do we want us to be? We, I would like to be a family of Jannah. So if you think I want to be a family of Jannah and you change that lens, then your positive psychology comes into play where you think, now, if I need to get to Jannah, what do I need to do? Because not going to hell is a lot of don'ts. Going to Jannah is a lot of do's. So in your family, if you have uh, uh, family rules that have a lot of do's, let's do this, let's play together, let's uh, spend time together, let's cook together, let's uh, watch a movie together. Whatever you're doing, it's, it's more uh, enabling than disabling. So really change your uh, focus from fear, fearful parenting to faithful parenting. And that is to go to Jannah and to be able to do that. And it will give you a positive purpose to do that. So here I have a quote from myself that I say, whenever there's a conflict, it's actually a signal that a conversation needs to be had. And whenever a child makes a mistake or you make a mistake, it's such a wonderful opportunity to teach and learn. So these are, these are not the end of the world. However grave the mistake is, however terrible the, uh, the outcome has been, that it's, it's so important that we, we use these opportunities to teach and to learn ourselves and uh, with our children as well, inshallah. So again, reiterating what lens you're wearing, you know, what glasses are you wearing on this day is so important. And then intentionally deciding in the morning, you know, I had a bad day yesterday or I had a bad night, but actually this morning I want to wear the Jannah lens. And, and that, that in itself might sound funny, but actually it's, it's positive self-talk and it really helps you to build that well-being in yourself to be able to radiate that to your families. And I want to uh, end with a couple of slides. So we, we have these beautiful du'as, you know, we, some of us are very privileged to have two parent families um, where it looks and it feels uh, to those looking on a wonderful setup. But we all have our struggles, two parent families, single families, uh, bereaved families, you know, widowed families. We all have our own journeys. And whether this, is, this other person is your spouse or your sibling or, your, or the teacher of the child or the imam or the football coach, whoever it is, we need to find these important others that will help us raise our child. Um, and, you know, I might, I might be in a two-parent family, but my husband really isn't helpful at the moment or my wife isn't very helpful at the moment. Find a, a, a person that is in your child's circle of influence to be able to support you raising this child. And the du'a, there's, you know, these two beautiful du'as that I, uh, I hold dear it, it, and we all use, it are so important to keep saying, making du'a uh, consistently that, oh Allah, you know, make me one who establishes regular play, prayer and also from my offspring, our Lord, and accept my du'a. So when you struggle with your child's du'a, really make du'a to Allah to rectify your own salah, which will help you to be a role model for your child so you can encourage them to pray. And prayer is a key. So I always say those families who pray together, who eat together uh, and who, um, you know, play together will stay together. So if you eat together, you play together, you pray together, inshallah, we will stay together. And the other dua is, oh, our Lord, grant us in our wives and our offspring the joy of our eyes and make us guides to those who guard against evil. So again, when you think about the coolness of your eyes, it's, it's to be able to be grateful. Look at the things your children are already doing that you can be grateful for. Um, last Ramadan and this Ramadan, what's the difference? Has your child developed? Has your child started to do things that they didn't do last Ramadan? So really uh, build on the positive and encourage those things to be the coolness of your eyes. And inshallah, the positivity will help to breed positivity in the family. Uh, and I'm not saying neglect the negative, but once you can have a positive lens, the language will, will then become positive in your interaction when you deal with conflict because we want to grow together inshallah we want to be a family of jannah and the last slide that i have um again as i mentioned is purpose is the most you know powerful motivator in the world and our purpose is to go to jannah our purpose is to worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be a faithful parent uh, in in allah's eyes and what beautiful guidance do we get uh, other than in uh, surah uh, ikhla, uh, sorry surah uh, al-asr which is by time Surely man is in loss. Save those who believe and do good deeds and enjoin on each other truth and enjoin on each other patience. Uh, 
So this beautiful uh, surah that we have, if you reflect it into parenting, it is time. Both parents need to invest positive time into the family. One parent cannot do it alone. If you're a father here and you work long hours, I urge you and I beseech you and I you know, encourage you to spend quality time. The best of fathers are those who spend time with their family, who spend time uh, loving their family, investing in their family, holding their spouse's hand and saying, we are together in this journey. And to be able to say to their children, you know, we both care for you. We both love each. We both love you. We just have a different way of parenting. And some of that will be, we'll need to talk it over. We argue over, but we'll, we'll get there in the end. So this, this partnership, this, this, you know, um, this journey together is so important. If you're separated, think of how better you can communicate with the other spouse, you know, with the other parent in order to communicate better in the interest of your child. So in order to do that, you think of the good that you can do together, but also enjoy patience with on each other. Encourage the other to be patient through love. Don't say it's all in your head and you're imagining all of that, but actually comfort each other and, and be the patience that the other requires. And, and that will generate positivity and well-being in the family, inshallah. Um, so I end with this, uh, and may Allah SWT encourage and, uh, well, he does encourage, but enable us to be the best of families, uh, inshallah, and, the, and the, be the families of Jannah, to, to protect our children from all the evil that is in this world uh, and, and to expose them to all the good that is there, all the opportunities that is there in the world, inshallah, and around us to, to benefit from it for the akhirah, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu alla ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa Jazakallah khair. I hand over to Brother Faisal. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Mahira, for uh, once again another very insightful session. And um, alhamdulillah, um, again, it raises a lot of uh, queries and questions. But at the same time, I think there's a lot to reflect on as well. Um, it's a very interesting thing that you mentioned, I mean, about fearful parenting to faithful parenting. And I think, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting model. And I think, I, I don't know if this is the case. I mean, I don't know what your observations on this, but I, I feel even at a, our community level, we tend to use our religion in a more fearful way rather than a faithful way. So yes. more don'ts and, and less of do's, you know. So if you do the X, Y, Z, you will go to Jahannam. If Jahannam, Jahannam seems to be a big thing. Whereas uh, I think the positive mindset, which you were, you were referring to, which is a really kind of, um, you know, uh, in line with, um, you know, faithful parenting. I think this is something that we need to actually develop as a, as a community, I think. I don't know, what, what do you think of, on that, Sister? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I, think um, I, I really, I do struggle uh, personally on, on a, on a